Welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Heather Isvron, and with me today are David Reedman and Desmond O'Neill. Welcome. Thanks, Heather. Thanks for having us. So both of you have graduated from our master's degree program and are currently in our Advanced Thinking for Homeland Security course and done a bit of research on a K-12 through school shooter database. Yes. So uh, tell us how you developed that program or that research project. So with the HSX program, we're taking a lot of what we've learned about experimentation and prototyping and applying that to the Homeland Security arena. So with that, we were going to have a hackathon where we have a one-day session and try to come up with actionable solutions around preventing or detecting school shootings. So with that, Des and I had a discussion um, about some ideas we had around threat and vulnerability testing. And we said, these are some ideas, and they played pretty well um, as we discussed them. We said, okay, well, let's find the data on this and let's see how our threat assessment would play against school shootings that have occurred. Yeah, so we ended up looking at, you know, what most people do is on, on the internet, trying to look at the different reports that have already been out there, the existing databases. And what we started to find out was there was a lot of different definitions in terms of what a school shooting was and what a school shooting wasn't. Some of the databases would have certain information and not others. Some of them uh, would not have dates or times or locations. So it was very difficult to really get a general understanding of what inclusively you know, school shootings were up to this point. So we wanted to, to find some information to test our hypothesis against. Mm -hmm. And we realized that the information just didn't really exist. Right. And so you endeavored upon this database. And, and how did you go about the definitions? I mean, that seems to be quite hard to do. Well, and that's, that's a great question. It's like, how do you define what a school shooting is? And, you know, based again on the research that we had done, a lot of people define it differently. And, you know, there's some have more inclusive criteria, some, you know, more exclusive. Some people include school buses, some people don't. Um, and so it was a matter of being like, how do you define this to be most inclusive? So if it is going to turn into some type of research project or there's going to be, you know, any, any number of stakeholders are going to want to use this, they're going to be able to have access to all of the information, and then they can pick and choose in some regards on what they wanted to do. And so you had to come up with that definition. And what is the definition? Yeah, so based on, on what we looked at, there can be students shot at a school. There can be visitors shot at a school. There can be students shot by other students, students by, shot by non-students, somebody who fires a distance away and the bullet lands at the school, a group of students walking away from the school that get in a shooting a half a mile away or right in front. And so we had to just draw the line somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we decided that the definition would be any time that a gun was brandished, fired, or a bullet landed on school property any time of day, regardless of the reason. And that would include zeros. So the zeros being that somebody held a class hostage, they never fired the weapon, there were no gunshots fired, there were no injuries, that's still included as zero. A group of students that were a half mile away from the school in the late afternoon and involved in a shooting would not be included. Mm -hmm. So we've drawn that it's about the location. It's anything that happens on school property for any reason. And we also included school buses in that, right? Because so any type of school bus with children is, is leaving the school, uh, going to you know, the drop-off location, because there are a number of school shootings that occur on a school bus, whether it was accidental, you know, intentional. We wanted to include that as well, to again, just to make sure that one, by definition, it fits into school property. Two, it is still students and it is still the school's responsibility. So we didn't want to exclude that just for the have the information. Right, and, and because you had done all that research and discovered the gaps, I, I would imagine you've tried to be as inclusive as sure. possible. Yeah. So who are the stakeholders in this project? Right now, say a school administrator is thinking about making an investment in hardening the security of the school, or setting up a threat assessment team, or a police chief is deciding, do I want to have a officer detailed to the school, or three officers, at what time should they be there? What we have is 1,300 school shooting incidents across a 50-year period that include all of these different reasons, all of these different t times, uh, the different categories of them. And what a police chief could do or what a school administrator could do is say, I'm interested in bulletproof classroom doors. Let me look across these 1,300 incidents and see which ones bulletproof classroom doors would impact. Say I want to assign an SRO to the school and I'm thinking, 
Do I want them seven to three or seven to seven? Do I want two? Do I want them to be there for the basketball or football game? Do I want them to be there for after school activities? You can look at this and see where shootings fall over the time period of the day, the days of the week, the different months on the calendar year, school days versus non-school day events that are still at the school. So you can have this really holistic view and decide are the funding decisions that I'm making going to align to the types of threats that occur. You know, when there are a lot of decisions being made, to go back to Dave's example in regards to hardening up a school, it's important for the stakeholders to know that half of school shootings occur outside, just based on the data that we collected. So that's, you know, a part of a population that may not have been considered. And so when you're, you know, you have a limited amount of money to spend on how to advance your school, it's important to understand, again, to understand, you know, where all the data falls in, in terms of it's not just within the school, you know, building an environment, the brick and mortar, it's also in the parking lot, it's in the, you know, sporting events, it's, you know, right outside the, in the football fields, whatever the, you know, case may be. So having all of that information in front of you, uh, then you can make your decision in terms of what's best for your community, for your children, for your resources. Yeah. Like right now, we pretty much have a one size fits all solution for school security. Mm -hmm. If there's a reported gunshot, you're going to lock down the school. The students close the windows, they lay on the floor, they put their uh, books over their heads, and they can be there for a number of hours until the school uh, is completely swept and cleared. What we found is that the majority of these incidents are very isolated, they're over quickly, and they usually only involve one person or a couple of people, and the shooter flees. I mean, if you think about it, if you get into uh, a fight with somebody at the school, and that fight escalates into you shooting them, you're not going to hang around waiting for the police to arrive. Uh, so we've tracked the, the disposition of all these events, so how they ended. And we look at whether the shooter fled, surrendered, was subdued, commit suicide, or barricaded themselves. And we found that the vast majority of the time, the shooters fled. So that takes you to the situation, thinking about what's the appropriate um, action to take at a school when, when gunshots are reported. In a lot of these cases, the gun and the shooter are gone. There's a single victim. And is it appropriate to have all of the other students in the classroom sheltered, believing that they might you know, be facing a shooter imminently uh, in their classroom for hours and hours? Hmm. So do we have the right solutions matched with the threats that we're facing? You guys went all the way back 50 years. We did. And um, what did you find? So over the decades. we wanted to make sure that we were, it was inclusive enough to say that, um, you know, when you talk about there being a trend and, you know, it, you know, based on Columbine or based on, um, you know, the using video games as violence. So we wanted to step back beyond before those things occurred. And we went back to 1970s. We thought they gave us a pretty good 50 year span. And to show that there's actually data as far back as that in terms of the school shooting. So, you know, we've got historical newspapers from the 70s and 80s that say school shootings are becoming an epidemic. So the word epidemic is still being used currently. And it's also been used, you know, 30 years ago in regards to, to the way the school shootings were reviewed. So when we went back, we saw, you know, a rise in school shootings in the 70s. We saw, again, a high number of school shootings in the 80s, a high school number of shootings in the 90s. So there is an increase in the last years. Um, but we also had one of our lowest years, I believe, in 2002, when we only had 11 school shootings compared to, you know, many years in the 1980s where there were, you know, 25, 30 school shootings. So it's important to put that into context in regards to where we are today versus where we were 50 years ago. We didn't want to exclude anything that was, you know, pre-Columbine because then the, you know, the possible assumption is it's just based on Columbine. So there's as many school shootings before Columbine in some sense as there were afterwards in that aspect. So we wanted to just give a broad span uh, for, again, the stakeholders, the academics, you know, the researchers, the media to have an accurate assessment of what actually is occurring over the, over the last half decade or the last half century. And you didn't just do a Google search. I mean, you went back. Correct. And what kinds of other documents did you look at? So we initially started off with the um, data that's out there that's, that's being publicly available through uh, the media, meaning that you know, there's government reports. You know, the FBI has come out with different reports. The Secret Service has come out with different reports. You know, there's the Brady campaign. There's a number of school sh shooting databases that are out there. So we looked at those initially and, and drew from those. And then we cross-referenced all those to make sure um, what we had and what we didn't, what conflicted, what we actually could verify independently of what a school shooting was. 
from there, we started to do internet searches. And you know, search as simply as you know, putting in parentheses, student shot, or you know, school shooting, and started to gather information that wasn't in some of these documents. After we scrubbed the end of the internet, we realized that there was life actually before the internet, and so we were able to get some subscriptions to archive newspapers, and simply the same type of search. We went, again, back as far as 1970, would put in um, you know, school shooter, shooting database, looking at different time periods, and simply would just start to find uh, a wealth of shootings that, especially in the 70s and 80s, that you can't find on the internet. So we were able to use a number of different those. Anything that yeah. I missed with that, Dave? And, and really, when, before we got into the newspaper archives, it looked like a pretty dramatic increase over a 50 year period for the number of school shootings that were occurring. We had a lot of incidents in the past decade, and that's because they're heavily reported. We had a few less in the 2000s. The 90s you know, were half that, 80s, and then the 70s had almost none. So it looked like it was this big growing trend. But once we looked at the newspaper archives, all of a sudden it filled out and flattened out across the years. So where there are some peaks and falls, we've seen uh, busy spots in the 70s, we've seen yeah. peaks in the 80s, and so it's more a pattern um, of it becomes a, a larger event, and you know, there are newspaper stories in the 70s and 80s where they're talking about the debate of how to better secure schools. They're talking about how to keep guns out of schools. Um, well, we have such short memories historically, right, so this, right. this sounds like you really have taken the time to be very inclusive for all the data sets. Right. Yeah. And so talk about the actual uh, publication that you developed, the methodology paper that is available uh, right. along with the database so that people who are actually studying this, reporting on it, um, talk about how that was developed and, and what's in it. So on this school shooting database website, uh, there are a number of different resources on there, uh, one being our methodology paper. Mm -hmm. So it's a peer reviewed paper uh, that has been reviewed by a number of the faculty members here at CHDS um, and is now published on the website. And it's a detailed explanation of our inclusion and exclusion criteria for how this database was populated. So for each column uh, that is a, a data point about each of the school shootings, the paper outlines exactly how we found that information, validated the information, developed the inclusion and exclusion criteria, our rationale for doing that, and then how somebody in the future could replicate this process. So this is about having a, um, a valid data source that anybody that wants to do scholarly research on this topic can go to. So you can understand exactly where this data came from and how you could replicate it in the future. Well, you all are going to keep it as a living, breathing right. database, correct? Right, and, and to, to further on what David had just said, it's important that it stays a living, breathing database that we continue to update, right? There's a lot of information that still comes and there's still things that we're trying to verify through official records, you know, from police departments. We've been working with various ones throughout the country to give us the accurate inside information in regards to making sure that the information that we do have in the database is as accurate as that it can be. So what we also want to do is set out a definition there that we hope everybody else will adopt to, right? It's a matter of saying it that as stakeholders, whether it's, again, school officials, whether it's policymakers, whether it's the media, whether it's law enforcement, if we can all start to work from the same definition, then we can collectively have a, the accurate number in regards to the number of school shootings that we do have. When we start to use different ideas, different thoughts, includes and exclusion criteria, then again, the numbers become difficult. And if you're trying to make decisions based on those numbers, then if we can all use, be on the same page, then we can really start getting an accurate assessment of where we are. Yeah, that's a, a great point that Des makes. It took us six months to stitch together all of these different databases because they're all based around different criteria. So it's literally combining apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. So if everybody's working from the same definition, it's very easy if somebody wants to do a study of the 60s, if somebody's doing a deep dive into validating the 90s, as long as you're working from the same definition with the same methodology, then you can stitch those pieces together. And with, and with the database and with the Excel spreadsheet that's downloaded on that as well, again, you can exclude certain factors that you don't want to include in your research. If you don't want to include suicides, which we did in ours, then you can exclude that. Uh, and again, it will give you more of an accurate number. You can you know, pinpoint down to the exact information that you want, but by initially, if you're going to add to the database or you're going to make your, you know, your own database or further research, if you can use that type of definition 
And then as, you know, whether it's new information shows up, new school shootings show up, we can use that, then we can kind of go from there. And so what would, what would you consider success of the use of this K through 12 school shooter database? It's a good question. I think success would be the, to start the conversation, to have a conversation that at times becomes politicized, um, to have people you know, exchanging information, uh, looking at the database, finding things that may not be accurate on that simply because it was reported inaccurately in the news, and giving us you know, that information. There's a way to contact us uh, through the center you know, in an effort to say, hey, this is you know, further information that could be included in your research. And so by you know, looking at it in terms of a community, it's, it's a community effort. You know, Dave and I started this, and we started as a very important project, but it's going to take a number of us uh, to you know, further develop and make it as, you know, as robust as possible. Well, the fact that it's peer-reviewed, yep. that you, I mean, it doesn't have a particular bent or agenda Correct. attached to it. It's simply academic. Correct. And it's community-minded, community-based, so people can contact you and, and add to it if they want. I think that's just fantastic, and it's a great service to the country. So beyond the definition that uh, you have, which is fantastic, tell us about how the database is composed. What are the categories? What's, what's included? Right, so since it's a huge amount of data, to make things easier for a user to filter, based on our assessment of what happened in the incident, we assigned a category. And these categories are 12 uh, kind of broad buckets so that if somebody's interested in one particular aspect of the shooting, they can filter by it. So the categories are things like, was it gang related? Was it a suicide? Was it an indiscriminate shooting? That would be your planned attack on the school. Was it a, d a domestic with a targeted victim? Yeah, and if you had, uh, again, a suicide, right? I think you may have said that. Accidental, there are a lot of accidental shootings. Um, that was important. We had some unknowns. We've had assassination attempts. So you have a number of different categories that when you look at the definition fits into that, but it's very difficult to say that it all fits under um, you know, A, B, or C. So we had, again, 12 different definitions. That was very specific in terms of what actually took place with that. And then through that, you can filter out how many of these were gang related? How many of these were just a simple one-on-one -on -one escalation of a fight that somebody pulled a gun, which is a number of those as well. So when someone pulls a gun, it's important to understand the circumstances surrounding that. And so when a lot of times we hear about the Parklands, you hear about the Columbines, you hear about those very egregious type of shootings, those are based on category, they are very insignificant, which is important for, again, you know, stakeholders to parents even know to the likelihood of their children being caught in something like that versus a one-on-one -on -one type of shooting. Not to downplay those, but it is important to separate things into categories. So Des went that, through that pretty quickly. Uh, are you saying that then the planned attacks are much less prevalent than we perhaps think through the news that we hear all the time? Yes, yeah, so back to the total numbers, the 1,300 incidents that we've recorded over the 50-year period, about 30 of them fall into those indiscriminate planned attack category. The vast majority are escalations of disputes. It's a fight that occurs in the hallway or in the school parking lot. Somebody pulls a gun, shoots someone, uh, bystanders are struck sometimes, and then it's over very quickly. And that's also very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. because there are hundreds and hundreds of fights that occur every day around the country that don't turn into shootings. Um, and then we see the other big category is gang shootings. And so that's excluded from a lot of data because we say it's a gang problem, not a school problem. Uh, but there are some very deadly gang shootings in terms of bystander students that are struck. So two gang members in the hallway start firing between classes. A dozen students are injured in the crossfire. That's very significant in terms of the number of innocent people that are injured. So, so what these categories allow folks to do is they can filter out the pieces they're not interested in. If you only want to look at planned attacks, you can exclude the, all the other cases out. If you want to see how gang violence impacts the schools, the number of innocent victims from it, you can filter that as well. What we wanted to do was give the user the power to get the information that they think is valuable. Are there any other misconceptions from the research that you conducted on the, in the database that are maybe myths that the general public should know? I thought one of the ones that I found interesting was a majority of school shootings are take place with a 22 caliber handgun, mm. um, as opposed to a lot of times it comes across as it being a, a rifle, some type of high-powered you know handgun. Which in fact, the 22 caliber seems to be the most prevalent right now. 
Do you, do you think of any, any other ones that you thought? Yeah, and that, that's a great point uh, that Des makes with that, is kids use what's accessible. So in a lot of cases, a 22 rifle or 22 pistol is left on the workbench or left in a kitchen drawer or a in grandma, grandma's purse. It's a gift that somebody got, you know, for, a, you know. Yeah, so, so kids may have the intent of carrying out a, an attack, but they don't have a weapon that has a tremendous amount of power. You know, we've also included BB guns and airsoft guns um, in this criteria. You know, in one case, a kid had a very detailed plan to attack the school, had camouflage, pulled the fire alarm. All he had was a BB gun. Hmm. And he shot a number of students with the BB gun. That's still important to study when you're thinking about uh, the signs that, that show that an incident could occur. Um, if that student had had a different weapon, it would have been a completely different outcome. Is there anything else that... Uh you'd like to discuss about this database? So the, the database, uh, the Excel version, the raw data, has a lot of cells that are marked unknown. Hmm. And the things that are unknown are usually because they weren't directly reported in the newspaper coverage. And in some of these, when they're 1970s or 1980s articles, things like the exact time that the incident occurred, the number of gunshots that were fired, the caliber of the weapon, those were not included. And so those details are somewhere in a police report. They're somewhere in records. There's somebody who remembers responding to that call. Those are the people who we would like to be in touch with them to fill in all these missing pieces. Because if we could say across 1,300 incidents, this is the average number of shots that are fired. Mm. Right now, you know, a number of those are unknown because it wasn't reported. We would like to be able to fill in all of the pieces uh, because from there, you can really uh, base your decisions on a lot of facts. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent work, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you.